Savvy, 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 that's the name you should know. Savvy, 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 he's the host of the show. With the games from the past, he's ready to cast. Savvy! Yeah. Hello everyone, it's me, Savvy, and welcome back to the Savvy Show, the show where cool peeps do dumb stuff. I'm your host, Savvy, here today to interview another wonderful content creator. First of all, thank you for watching the first episode of the Savvy Show. We're already at the third episode, so maybe you've watched the second episode. If not, it'll all be in a very fancy playlist and today's episode will be very interesting as we'll have a very very special guest you may not know them and some of you may know them so please welcome my fellow colleague Joey it's me hello you thank doing? you thank you for inviting me I'm doing good how about you I'm doing very good thank you so uh, this is a question that I do to every single content creator um, for everybody watching this at home, uh, because some may not know who you are and what type of content you do, may like, could you please introduce yourself and tell us what type of like content do you do and stuff like that? So basically, I'm the guy responsible of creating all those Game Boy the Garage games that blew up in popularity last year. That's me, Julie. It's me. <laughs> That's right, guys. I got the biggest game builder garage content creator here in the show. It's a pleasure having you here, Joe. It's me. It's kind of amazing seeing you here and kind of weird, too. So I wanted to ask you something very peculiar, very particular. Uh, how did you start making these games in Game Builder Garage? And also, as some of you may not remember, Game Builder Garage was the official creator by Nintendo of like games, and uh, it's still on Nintendo Switch if you want to check it out, and you can play some of Joey's creations. So getting back to the question, how did you start making games for Game Builder Garage? Well. I actually started not with Game Builder Garage, but with Nintendo Labo. When Nintendo Labo was announced, I was pretty intrigued by the idea of cardboard and stuff. So I bought it day one, the variety kit. And inside the variety kit, there was an option where you can, can go to this uh, lab called the garage, where you could already program little games or applications for the cardboard. So I started there to kind of uh, experiment with all the options that were provided. And I created some kind of weird games there, like you can make the Labo car fall off and make some weird noise or very, very simple stuff. And then when the Nintendo Direct came, or I don't know, maybe it came, was Game of the Garage announced just in the YouTube channel? I don't remember exactly. I but don't remember once either, I, actually. Me, me neither, but once I saw it, I, I, I immediately understood, oh, that's the game I'm gonna buy. Day one, day one. And yeah. so I did. Okay, so um, continuing talking about Game Builder Garage, is something that I wanted to ask you is um, when, like, some, do you have some advice for everybody watching here at home when it comes to making a video game? What do you keep in mind while making a new game? Is there, like, a little list of things you have or do you just follow what like you think in your heart and like what you desire in that moment hmm well i think that well this goes for any game developer if you want to make a good game you need to be a person who enjoys game and understands what makes those game that much enjoyable to you and then try to recreate that it's uh, very simple you have to be a gamer, you have to have experience with masterpieces, play all the best games that are out there and learn from other games. Yes, yes. So every time you play a new game, you learn something new. You you sort of just understand what makes, what makes them funny. When I was a little boy, uh, I played a lot of video games, but I didn't quite understand what made them so fun to me. It just came through the years as I grew up. I had more knowledge about game development, the game industry as a whole, and I followed a lot of YouTube channels that talk about video games and game design. So at a certain point, I just uh, became good at making games because I am good at playing games and enjoying games. Yes, so play games and study games, I will say. 
Okay, so you have said that uh, when you were a kid you play a lot of different games, so I'm very intrigued. What were the biggest inspirations when you were a kid? What, what were the biggest games from your childhood? Well, my first console was the Nintendo 64. Ooh. And my first game on that console was Super Mario 64, of course. And that was the, the, my very first video game I ever played. And I spent like three years to complete that game because I was like six years old. I had no experience with video games. That game was like super difficult for me. But I played that game for three years. I mean, I will say that game not only shaped my gaming knowledge and my gaming taste, it even shaped my personality and who I am today. I own basically anything to Super Mario 64 and all the things I love in video games are things that were present in Super Mario 64. The exploration factor, the fun of the platforming, all the, the mystery, the mystery surrounding the castle. There are so many closed doors. You have no idea what's uh, what's behind the door. It's yeah. cre it creates so much curiosity, that game, and I'm a very curious person myself. So. Yeah, I would say Super Mario 64 has to be the biggest influence. But then, of course, I played all the Zelda games, all the Pokemon games, <laughs> basically anything. But I would say it all started with Super Mario 64. That's very interesting, because I have my own little stupid story uh, with Super Mario 64. It's probably one of my favorite games of all time, if not my favorite game of all time. I discovered it when it was around uh, maybe 7 or so, and it was playing with my DS that my father gave to me. And um, I I played the remake version, Super Mario 64 DS, and it was mind blowing. Uh, but because I was like a very very bad at video games at the time, I really didn't get far at the game. It was then later, when I was much older, that thanks to emulation, I got into playing the original Super Mario 64. And speaking of which, emulation, I know it's kind of a taboo topic to like talk about and discuss, but. Thanks to emulation, I have played and discovered so many games that I wouldn't have discovered otherwise. Well, at least you played it with a proper controller. Oh, I used a Logitech controller. Like, it has a very similar, um, a very similar scheme and setup and design to the Xbox One, with like two sticks and buttons. And so, getting back to Super Mario 64, it was awesome. It was amazing because it was i remember getting lost inside the world of super mario 64 every level especially bob on battlefield and princess peach's castle i would roam around and get lost into the castle or some of the paintings for hours on end and being able to explore all these rooms alone unknown alone nonetheless yeah that was also like a big part of the game for me the the castle felt empty, but a while at the same time it had so much personality, but at the same time it was so cold and, and and weird. That's why, in my opinion, Super Mario 64 is still subject to many different creepypastas and uh, ARGs to this day. Like, ooh, spooky Mario story. And I think this one is the creepiest one uh, the bunch because not only is it uh, very very popular amongst the gaming community and it's also a wonderful game, but also because it has this very weird and ominous feeling. Yes, I believe uh, video games do a great thing with kids, which is expose them to being alone and responsible on their own in a certain way. For example, when I was a little child, I, I spent most of my time with my parents, of course. Uh, there were just some brief moments, for example, we were at some friend's house and the parents were chatting uh, between each other and I was like alone, so I asked my mom, can I explore this house, can I wander around? And those were like the only moments where I truly was alone, wandering around in a home, in a garden, completely alone and just watching all the things around to see and going wherever I, it was possible to go. And that was basically what I was doing in Super Mario 64. I was alone while playing that game. I was alone, I was by myself, I was, I was a little child with no experience of the real world. And I was exploring like I never did before, like I never did anywhere. So that's even more magical for a child to have this enormous castle full of secrets and hidden doors. And there was a door underwater. It was the first time I, the first thing I saw when I booted up the game. Why is there a door underwater? I yeah. need to know. 
what what's behind it. I'm gonna explore. I can I can sleep at night. I want to know what's there. Why is there a door? And then I found out it's just a, a, an exit actually to get the invisibility capsule. What kind of what <laughs> it was kind of disappointing, but the magic is still there in that game. So it has a big impact on children for that reason, I believe. Okay, getting back and linking the two main arguments that we've discussed, um, like right now in this episode of the Savvy Show, we talked about Super Mario 64, but also Game Builder Garage. Have you seen that someone, like quite recently, at least at the time of uh, recording this episode, has recreated the outside of Princess Peach's castle inside of Game Builder Garage? Not only that, but they also made uh, like the model of Mario in a very creative way and they also recreated most of its moveset which in my opinion this may be very basic but to the eye of someone who's been playing the game for uh, since it came out uh, this is wild yes uh, many recreated that I believe someone in the last week did that or not yes exactly I, I the only problem I had with his game is why did he model the trees in 3d he just needed to do a plain texture and make it face the camera the whole way, just like in Mario 64. It would have been so much easier. <laughs> so, when you bought Game Builder Garage, something that I want to ask you is, apart from making games yourself as one of the biggest content creators inside of the game, did you actually experience some of the other games and maybe even like the game itself, the little tutorial mode? Yes, I played a lot of games. I downloaded a lot of games from other content creators. So yes, of course. I yeah, I think I even played some of your games. Did I? Maybe I streamed them even. My games? That's that's weird. I probably just submitted a game because I I never made a game myself. I think you submitted a game in a live stream once. So, whilst we were talking about the project and process of making games, you have mentioned how it's important to keep in mind and keep into account um, the exper experiences with um, games from the past and maybe um, like some of the best games of all time too, but with an engine as objectively limited as Game Builder Garage, what would you say is the main priority of a creator? Well, the thing is, you don't actually don't need much to make a fun game. If you think about all the era of Game Boy games, the very early Game Boy games, or the very early NES games, um, they were all very, quite, quite simple games, and yet they were all radically different. So you can focus on making original games but keep them small keep them simple but make them as original as possible you know as they say limitations create creativity because of course if you are have any tool available in the universe then you're going just to make things very easily you don't uh, you don't reason them too much about them you don't think about what you're doing but once you have very limited set of tools you sort of have to find some weird score shots and have some very uh, weird ideas to create something that actually works. So it sort of just forces your creativity, but because the only thing you can make in order to be remarkable is either make it play very good, make it very original, or make it look very fun. So you're sort of just forced to make original stuff using Game of the Garage in a way, at least if you want to be successful, I think. You can just make crazy games, of course. Like, in my opinion, amongst all the games that you've made, and I know like this was one of the simplest games around like all of your creations, but uh, my favorite one has to be Super Wario Galaxy. It's a game for like maybe those who don't know, this will sound super dumb, but it's a game where Wario farts across the galaxy, <laughs> taking like little... Um, little colorful points and things, and it was fun and effective. Because it's Wario, because it's Wario. And talking about Wario now, you're not only a creator, as you said, in Labo and Game Builder Garage, but also in Mario Maker. Not only that, but if I recall, you also have recreated the outside of Princess Peach's castle inside of Animal Crossing New Horizons. So, uh, with these two games, do you have some kind of linking and connection and history with these two series? 
Well, let's see. Well, let's start with Mario Maker. I discovered Mario Maker on the Wii U. I the Wii U is the only Nintendo console I don't own for whatever reason. Uh, so I never played Mario Maker back then on the original Wii U, but I bought it on Nintendo 3DS as soon as it came out, and I created a lot of levels. I just started to create stages, but I had no one to actually playtest them. It was just me playing them. And I used to play a game on PC that was called Eggbird. It was a crappy platformer where you had also a level editor. So I already had some experience in creating levels. But I didn't know what I was doing. I was just trying to imitate Nintendo games. I didn't know anything about 2D level design. So I just made lots of stages and figure out what is fun and what is not by making them try to my friends from time to time. And then, of course, when Mario Maker 2 was announced, uh, day one, Mario Maker on my Nintendo Switch, and oh my god, I, I kept making stages every day, every day, uh, like uh, every night even. Yes, and in Mario Maker 2, the, the nice thing is that Mario Maker 2 provides you with uh, level design lessons that teach you how to make a proper level, how to scale difficulty, how to make uh, a level fun to play, not too punishing, uh, like how to, for example, how to use the coins to attract attention or, or to create a path to make the level understandable, how to create atmosphere in a level. It, the game teaches you all those things and I tried my best to incorporate those things in my level. And of course, all the experience I had with other platforms like Mario or Celeste, for example. Oh, Celeste is a very good game. I still have to play it, sadly, but uh, from all the reviews I've seen and a uh, little bit of like snippets of gameplay and, and even memes, um, I've seen that uh, Celeste is a beautiful game. Not only does it look incredible, but it also achieves a very... A uh, very strong story because a lot of platformers are basically uh, get from point A to point B to save uh, the main Egg McGuffin, you know, either the Princess or the Chaos Emeralds. It still is like a very simple story, but uh, I think that what makes OS such a good experience is the fact that there is not only very good gameplay, very good graphics, but also a very good and touching story. Not only that, but I also think it's admirable to see how an indie studio and an indie game, more specifically, is on par with Sony, Nintendo, everything. As a game developer yourself, um, in my opinion, it's amazing how anyone can start making their own masterpiece. And no matter how big or small the studio is, or maybe how big the budget is, or how long the game is, or how expensive it was, you don't have to be a AAA game with super cool graphics to be the next game of the year. Of course, yes. Basically, well, if, if you think about it, if you think, for example, of Super Mario World, or Super Mario Bros. 3, or even Link to the Past, those games have been developed by teams that were at the time as small as the indie developers today. So even those big games are actually indie games, we, we could say, if you, if you just count the number of the people working on it and then the experience of the people working on those classics. So now that gaming is growing in popularity, much more little studios can exist and create literal masterpieces, just like the Nintendo famous, the most famous Nintendo games were at, back at, at the time, yes. Now, as we've said before, you not only make games inside of Mario Maker and Game Build Garage and Labo, but we've also mentioned the world of Animal Crossing, which is another game which, which involves a lot around creating your own world and meeting new characters. Now, you gotta understand I have a very long story with Animal Crossing. As I said before, the DS uh, has been a very big part of my childhood, and one of the games that I uh, played a lot with uh, my sister was Animal Crossing Wild World, and it was an amazing game. You gotta understand that it was wild to me, because I was like, wow, this game is not tough, this game is not hard, this game is just relaxing, you can go from point A to point B, and uh, one of my biggest childhood traumas comes from that game. You know, you gotta understand that 
um, many times in the past playing other games, it would just leave the console be and never actually check the battery. And so, if the battery starts going, um, starts like flashing red lights, meaning that it's going very low and it's probably gonna turn off at any second, I'm probably gonna be like, yeah, sure, I'm gonna get the charger. And one day we were playing the game, we were playing uh, Animal Crossing on a DS, so um, we saw that like the, the red light was like flashing, and so I said, well, uh, the battery is going down. And so I went to my parents' room and grabbed the charger, get back into my room, and to my surprise, I see the DS. The screen was pitch black, and it was like, no deal. Because you gotta get into the mindset of somebody who um never experienced something like that with animal crossing so i said yeah i'm gonna just turn it on and nothing is going to happen how wrong how wrong was i because i turned the ds back on with my sister and we take a look at the screen and this guy shows up and he said hey why didn't you why, why didn't you save your game this was hell me and my sister were terrified petrified at this because we were like what we thought for the longest time that the game was inaccessible and the game was gone, dead and gone forever. Because we uh, we read and said, you gotta apologize. And because we were just kids, we, we apologized like two times. And if I remember correctly, you have to apologize something like three, four times. But then, no. Oh. And I remember like getting very angry because I was like, bang. Bye bye, no more games. So, do you have like a similar experience to the one I had with Rosetti? No, I actually didn't grow up playing Animal Crossing on the Nintendo DS. No, but I, I know that there are many DS games that, for some reason, punish you for uh, not saving the game. For example, I was playing a Japanese dating simulator on my Nintendo DS lately, and it did the same thing as Mr. Rossetti, so I don't know why they were so fixated with this thing on the Nintendo DS era. It's kind of creepy, it's like they know what you did. <laughs> Maybe it was to avoid like players cheating, because I remember that there was like some time traveling involved in Animal Crossing if you mess around with the settings of your console and maybe like you were trying to like shut the, the console off either when a new villager was coming or an old one was leaving uh, so maybe this was done so that uh, then when kids would do such a stupid decision they would turn the console back on and Rossetti would scare the ever-living shit out of them, which is very a very bold move from Nintendo, but I mean, I guess so, it worked for me and my sister. Also, what's the name of that dating sim, asking for a friend? Yeah, it has, it has a Japanese name, I can't quite remember it. I, I believe it was an English name, but written in Japanese, so it's a very weird accent. I, I, I will let you know later. Oh, so like a very Japanese-ish title, okay. So, Animal Crossing, um, where did I start? I The first Animal Crossing I played was New Leaf on my Nintendo 3DS. So, at a certain point in my life, I had to decide if I wanted to play The Legend of Zelda Phantom Horglass or Animal Crossing Wild World on the Nintendo DS. And, and I decided to play the Legend of Zelda Phantom Horglass, and that was my very, very first Zelda game I ever played. And I know many will think, oh, it's, it's that shitty one, yes, but I enjoyed the hell out of that game. And then, of course, I played all the other Zelda games, so I abandoned Animal Crossing, but I gained The Legend of Zelda, so I think it was a good choice, but I completely missed out on Animal Crossing in the Nintendo DS. So, once I had my 3DS, I decided, well, now I gotta play, I gotta go back home to play Animal Crossing New Leaf on my Nintendo 3DS. And I did, so I bought Animal Crossing New Leaf and I had quite a big, a good time with it. I enjoyed decorating my home more than anything. I made it in a Victorian English uh, uh, 800 style. I made oh, a very classic kitchen, uh, yeah, I made it. And I even created a little house that was a sort of recreation of the Shining Hotel from the movie The Shining from Stanley Kubrick, yeah. So I just had fun with all the personalization options and I played it for a year or two and I, and I enjoyed it a lot. And of course, once New Leaf was announced on the Nintendo Switch, I got it day one and, and I fell in love with it because it, it, wasn't, it wasn't much about interaction with villagers it wasn't much about any story or relationship. 
Uh, I mean, I, I have never really cared about those things, even though I know many people play Animal Crossing just because they love the little world of animals and people interactions and personalities. But I've never been the kind of people who enjoys that part of the game. I have more be always always been the guy who enjoys the creativity side more. So. New Horizons was basically all creativity. You can go all out with patterns, personalization, terraforming. You, you can basically create anything your mind can imagine. You can combine uh, different elements. You can place outside. You, you can change the color to like make it look, look like something else. And I created so many things. So basically, I named my island Foresight, which is, of course, a reference to... Yeah, uh, exactly, for uh, Earthbound, yes. Um, but my island can also be divided in two. For example, one quarter of my island is a complete recreation of Japan. The ancient historical Japan with the traditional house, recreated with historical accuracy, and all the modern Japan, like with a kombini and a gaming store and all that things. Yes, I recreated a Japan area. And I recreated even the Mushroom Kingdom when the Mario items arrived. Before the update game came out, I already uh, destroyed like one quarter of my island and built a castle and made all the plays just with the items in mind where I already knew where to place them. So I worked a lot of that thing too. And then of course on my home. I worked so much on my home, which is exactly like the one I had in New Leaf. So I had a lot of fun creating a Victorian style home, like almost like Luigi's Mansion, kind of creepy, but okay. also welcoming in a way. You can play with atmosphere, you can make the, 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 you can choose the sounds of rain outside, the lighting. There are so many atmospheric touches you can do. It drives me insane. It really, it's really, if you are a creative person, that game will automatically trigger something and you will make you create lots of things. And I also have a fetish for houses and buildings and architecture and IKEA, if we could say that. So, yeah, it was like the game made for me. Oh, since you seem so much invested in uh, house designing, uh, there is also an Animal Crossing game that was probably made just for you. It's called Animal Crossing Happy Home Designer, and it was for the Nintendo 3DS. And it was made so that people could just... Um, not only um, like organize their own house, but everybody's house to make it look very pretty in different styles, and it was a very cool game. I have not played a uh, home designer, but I played the DLC, the Happy Home Paradise DLC on the 3D uh, on the Switch, which is basically yeah. the same. Thing, yes, but uh, I I don't like the idea of creating so beautiful such such beautiful houses that sort of sort of just exist for themselves. I like it when they are something you. I, I always, when I, when I create my island, I always imagine what will people do when they are here for the, for the first time and they don't know anything and they start exploring. How can I guide them? How can I surprise them? So I really uh, try to make my house as beautiful as I can, not just because I want a nice home, but so that when people discover it and go inside, they are mesmerized by looking at it, they are surprised. Maybe they don't expect that when they go downstairs, they are suddenly in a Mario themed the underground area and there's a pipe that once they take it, that it brings them outside in the Mushroom Kingdom with the castle. They will never expect it. It's like such a surprise, such a hidden entrance to such a big area. So I also enjoy a lot uh, connecting all those houses and places uh, between each other, not just le letting them exi exist for their own beauty and for their own purpose but give the player something to explore on the island and have fun yeah, with. Yeah. Yes, it, it's connected in a fun way, like always, uh, that, that always surprises you, where things are kind of hidden and then all of a sudden there is a big change in atmosphere, something like that, yes. Oh, I had a uh, experience, a uh, very similar experience too, because uh, my own, like, quote-unquote, secret experience with houses was when I... I played uh, this game called Pokemon, how was it, Alpha Sapphire for my 3DS. It had this feature where you could build your own uh, secret, um, like, passage, and secret passages, and secret buildings, and you could put little statues, and, and different plants, and it was a very cute feature in my opinion, because it added so much from the personality of this game, and also, like, break the game from the combat and stuff. 
I have a lot of memories about that game actually. One another goofy memory, let's say, was me beating the first gym with uh, level 100 Arceus, but that's the story. That's the story for another day. I mean, people, uh, everyone finds something different they enjoy in a game. For, exam for example, Pokemon. Lots of people play Pokemon competitively, for example. And I do not. I play them casually, so I enjoy more the world around the Pokemon, the, the environments, the, the characters and such. While, for example, some people play Smash casually, but I, I don't play Smash casually. I am a, I am a very competitive uh, Super Smash Brothers player. I even join tournaments and I train. So, yes, we all, we all enjoy games differently. And games, the, 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 the ideal game is a game that can provide something for everyone and a lot of customization options, so that everyone can make what they enjoy in that game. And from that point of view, we could say that Animal Crossing uh, New Horizon is kind of lacking, because it's more leaning towards the creativity and not so much about the characters' interactions and story. Yes. Okay, so for now we have discussed the, the main inspirations behind the games, but uh, something that I would talk, that I would like to discuss about and talk, is the process between and behind each and every game you worked on. I think that the one we should be starting with was your like uh, big success that was Link Goes Crazy in Town. Uh, it was so big in fact that like stuff like uh, uh, gaming outlets like Game Explain and other websites featured in their videos as it was one of the first big uh, games based on sprites and it was very funny. So, how did you came up with such a crazy idea? Um, well, in a certain way, I did not came up with such a crazy idea. It sort of just created it by it just it sort of just came by itself. So, my my intent at first was to create a game with a garage game that will look very good, at least aesthetically, because once I saw the very first trailer of Game Builder Garage, I saw that you can create pixel art, but I have, haven't seen anything too astonishing or polished, so I wanted to make something that at least looks great. So I decided, what if I what if I create a Zelda game? And so I sort of just started programming, well, let's see, we have a character, we have to create a spin attack, it's a, a charged spin attack, so I just well, was creating all those things. And, and then, if, for example, uh, when Lynx hit the, hits the sword, he actually just uh, launches a sphere forward that destroys an object, for example. So I just created that little interaction. And yeah, I worked like for a whole day on the physics, on the engine, on the commands uh, of that game. And it was too hard to create enemies for Link, like uh, sentient beings that have to be destroyed and then that, that could hit Link and kill him. Uh, so it was too much work to do and I said, you know what, it, it's just fun going around and breaking things. So I just keep the game as simple as, as that and we just make that where that will Link goes around and breaks things that are already breakable. Like the... yes, yes, exactly, the crates, they were already breakable and I also created the pots. So yeah, it was just fun to go around and destroy them, also because I implemented HD Rumble that gives some nice feedback when you break the things. Um, and then I added some characters, and I saw, hey, those characters, they don't, they, they, they don't say anything to me destroying everything. So I created some interactions with the characters, made them change emotions, like add some sound lady, yeah. And then I added, of course, the chickens, because they were very easy to program. You just have to make a chicken, add a counter, hit it five times, and then spam chickens. Something that I admire was that uh, in this limited engine that is Game Builder Garage, you managed to infuse a lot of personality in each and every character and sprite and animation. There's all the, the citizens in the city, there's the, the cuckoos, there's the old lady, and uh, even Link itself, um, all everything that is in the game is full of personality, and that's amazing. That's very admirable. That's that's very 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 important. Uh, well, the, uh, the most important thing is to make the game just fun by itself. I mean, even when I had no sprites and I was playing the game basically naked with any with any sprite attached anywhere, I had already fun just going around and breaking things. So how can I make this even more fun? 
uh, like exaggerate Link's expression, make the situation itself funny, like Link destroying everything for no other reason at all, which yeah. is something you do in the games actually. Yes, yeah, so I think personality is very important of, in the fun factor and enjoyment of a game. I think they are uh, quite a deal breaker. They can make or change a game completely. Yes, for example, we talked about Wario, the Wario farting game, Wario Galaxy. Yes. Uh, I just created a game where you are a rect rectangle and when you press A, you get some cinetic energy from behind and it pumps you forward. So I just created that very basic space invader physics, physics basically. And I, th I thought about a spaceship at first. So I added like the, the puff animation where like the little clouds came out. So to see if, if it looks like uh, an actual rocket that will launch uh, itself. But it yeah. sort of just looks like little farts to me. And, okay. and, and then I immediately thought about Wario. And then I said, oh my god, this is such a great idea. I'm just going to make Wario that farts his way through space. That's so great. And then I made Wario Galaxy. I just created a Wario sprite, a few animations. And yeah, start with from Mario Galaxy. I have a bit of music. And there it is, Wario farting through space. Only because I saw that cloud that smoke, uh, that cloud smoke, and thought about farts, and then thought about Wario. So my brain just made this wacky connection, and there it is. Okay, so for now we've been talking about games that are based on other IPs. For example, Mario, uh, because we've talked about Wario. There's also Luigi's Mansion. We've seen a lot of different IPs, but there is something that I wanted to ask you. There is. Uh, one game that you made that is called the Game Builder Garage in Game Builder Garage. With that not being based on an IP and in, in the game itself, how did you come up with the game and like the main idea? Well, because it was sort of just a meme. Uh, everywhere in the comments, uh, they always write, "Hey, someone is gonna create Game Builder Garage in Game Builder Garage one day." It's something they write on every, basically in every in every game you can create something. They write, hey, someday they are create the same game in the game, like Mario Maker and Mario Maker. So I thought, well, can you really recreate Game of the Garage and Game of the Garage? Like, can you really create using the Nodons a software where you program something? Uh, I think that the person who really got closer to that idea was the one who created Minecraft in Game of the Garage because he created a game where you can create something. But in my game, it's not really Game Builder Garage in Game Builder Garage. It's more of a, just a platformer that is inspired based on, by, based yeah. on, game, on the Game Builder Garage mechanics. Um, so, but I, called, I still call it Game Builder Garage and Game Builder Garage because I thought this title was very catchy and kind of a meme. And, but then I thought seriously about it because Game Builder Garage is not, a, uh, it's not just a software to develop games. It, it is a game itself because it has lots of fun animation. Just creating games is fun. It's, it's a game itself. So I thought, well, since it is so fun to connect nodons and create interactions, why can't I just transform those very basic interactions in a little puzzle game? Um, and then uh, I created that platformer, yes. Uh, and my main focus was to make it at least look as much as possible as a Game Builder Garage programming screen, like with the yellow background and the nodes. I made them in, in pixel art and made them look just like in the programming screen. And it was very confusing when I switched from gameplay to programming screen because things looked so similar that I sometimes get got confused myself while programming that game. But it was a, it was a fun idea, I think, yes. I had fun creating it. Okay, so for now we've been talking about Game Builder Garage, and I wanted to talk about something more serious and more sad. Apart from people like you and other creators of Game Builder Garage and the very talented fan base that still supports the game, the game has been forgotten so much so that at the start of the episode we had to do a little bit of an introduction to the game because a lot of people may not even remember what the game was about, what the game was. So. Something that I wanted to ask you is, what do you think about this? What do you think about this entire situation? What do you think, why, especially, why do you think uh, Game Builder Garage flopped, quote-unquote? Do you, do you think that Nintendo did some poor marketing? Did they fail to make the game appealing like they wanted to? I just want to hear 
the idea and the thoughts of someone who's been in the community for uh, way longer than I have ever been and you have uh, so much more um, experience in making games and so you're practically the the pillar of Game Builder Garage. So what do you think of this entire situation? So this is weird because it's not even the first time this happens. We've seen Nintendo Labo, Mario... Yeah, I believe that the audience for this game is a niche. And the target audience is not we. Like people like me. I mean, this, this game is per perfect for me. But I yeah. am not the target of Nintendo with this game. And so are not all the even more talented developers, uh, programmers uh, like me. This is not a game for them. Um... I am not a good developer, actually. I just make my games as fun as I can with the little uh, things I can do and make them look as good and give them a lot of personality. That's why they are so popular. But uh, yes, that game is basically directed to children. They have no experience whatsoever in game programming. It's more of a teaching tool than a true software to develop games. Yeah. It is so... The marketing is not towards people that might actually enjoy it it's, it's weird to say like the wrong people are enjoying this game in the right way uh, if, if we can say so yes because uh, there are also there are lots of videos on youtube of nintendo promoting this game in schools like giving it to teachers and showing their kids how to program uh, it was the same aim that nintendo labo had to teach kids how programming works and how be told to be creative, how to create things and then personalize them. So it's a very kid, kids aim product as much as uh, uh, we, uh, we are actually adults and most of the people who play it are actually adults that are just having fun to see what crazy things can be done with such a limited tool set. So yes, they didn't make a lot of advertisement and they didn't update the game or they didn't sponsor the game any further so it just sort of just died out because I mean, there is Super Mario Odyssey, as Luigi's Mansion, Zelda, there are so many big titles on the Switch that this one is like, it, it, even, even Super Mario Maker, that is like 1,000 times more popular than Gable the Garage, is dying out. Uh, like, my, my levels that I create, like, in, Game Boy, in, uh, sorry, in Mario Maker uh, the last year, for example, had just 20 likes, 20 people who played them, so... Yeah, I think it, it's it's the fate of those kind of games if you don't update them, I think. So this is weird because it's not even the first time this happens. We've seen Nintendo Labo, Mario Maker, Game Builder Garage, but there's actually another game that comes up to my mind when talking about uh, like game creation. Actually, two games. Uh, those being WarioWare DIY and Mario Paint. Because if you think about it, WarioWare DIY was literally make your own micro games and then even showed them with the WarioWare DIY showcase on Wii. And Mario Paint was literally the first big creator and it was a very, like, a, a novelty because not only you could draw, uh, because, like, it's Mario Paint, you could draw, you can color, you could make music, sprite animations, you could make anything with that game. The weird thing about WarioWare DIY, and this feels very weird because we're talking about a Wario game, was that um, there were, like, a lot of different uh, kids and stuff that... Uh, talked and uh, played with this game and made their own creations, but like the biggest and I mean the biggest uh, compilations of games were erotic based micro games. There's full on compilations on YouTube, obviously censored to fit with the um, like the terms of service and, and stuff and to avoid to get demonetized and ban off of YouTube. And they're all based around, they're all very Japanese, you know, I don't want this to sound very racist, but uh, this, like, they uh, have, like, a very anime style, and they feature a lot of nudity and stuff, and I think that this was made because there were no limits, you could um, put them into the... Um, WarioWare uh, DIY showcase on Wii, but there wasn't really any limit. Nintendo wasn't checking your own cartridge to see what type of micro games you made. No, 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 no. It was far different. You, uh, you could literally just put them and keep them for yourself. Kind of like how you can do with some Game Builder Garage games. You can keep them to yourself. But that, in uh, that game, you could draw. You can make your own music. So there were no limits, and it shows.
<laughs> Honestly, I, I don't see how anyone can really make anything explicit in Game Builder Garage apart from uh, sprite-based stuff in games. But there are some erotic games on the Nintendo Switch. I, I have a viewer which is probably laughing their ass off uh, watching this. Their name is Haha. <laughs> I'm a superstar in Atsukiden 2, we have this like inside joke between me and them. They have been requested me checking out uh, the games uh, Hentai vs Evil and another game which I don't remember its name but it was like uh, Galaga but Tits was uh, um, I, I, I cannot for the love of me remember what it's called but it was like a a sequel of a game, we'll probably put here on, on screen the title of this game. Uh, so yeah, there are many uh, like erotic games on Nintendo Switch. Obviously not s straight up pornography or mm, hentai games. Uh, even though games like Hentai vs Evil and this other game I don't really know. Um, they like get into a little bit of risque territory, like they show a little bit of more risque outfits. So, it is possible, and it's well how Nintendo is, uh, like, actually approves these games and doesn't uh, ban them from the Nintendo eShop. Doki Doki Literature Club, like, that's a peak example of something that Nintendo would have never done in the, the Wii era, because it's a game that, I don't know if you played it, but it's, uh... Like, a very interesting, let's say, to avoid any spoilers because you might have not played this game, um, a very interesting visual novel, and it goes into psychological horror elements, so it's cool seeing Nintendo upsetting this. Do, do you know about this game? Yes, I played it just last, last year, I played it last year, yes. This is a game made to blow your mind, so you don't want to go in spoiled. Please don't play any of the previously mentioned games that are on Nintendo Switch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm probably gonna get demonetized for this. This entire segment is wild, but to be honest, that's the beauty of a talk show, you know? You, you just gotta talk, you just gotta express how you feel and talk about whatever you want. So please, do not play these. <laughs> please do not play these. But please play Game of the Garage. That's right, there's gonna be the, the code here on screen to the account page for um, Julie on Game Builder Garage, and that's also going to be on the description, and not only the code for uh, all of their games, but also some other stuff, like their page for the unofficial mm, Game Builder Garage website, it includes little descriptions, comments, you can find anything you want there. And uh, that's all also like include some other types of social media down below. So please go check out Julie because not only they are amazing at Game Builder Garage, but also amazing at art. Now you know what that means. If I invite someone who is very good at art, the only reasonable thing that I have to do is challenge them to an art challenge. Now last time we did the art challenge, we... I used like uh, I used Photoshop to draw those characters, and they still turned very bad. But this time, since I'm working and challenging an actual artist, no offense, Oniko, uh, I'm going to use something more particular because you gotta know, Julie also makes some art on Mario Paint, which I'm gonna show. They are amazing art pieces, so. Julie is gonna draw on a professional tablet, whereas me, Savvy, your wonderful host, is gonna draw on Mario Paint. Now, since I don't have any way to capture an old television or an SNES, you're gonna see my emulator. That's right, you're gonna see my ugly Mac Mouse here, and I'm going to draw, as well as Julie, we are both going to draw Mario from Mario Paint, drawing something that we'll decide later um, and both in, with these different things so we're going to have uh, let's say 10 minutes circa and we are going to draw to the best of our capacities get your brushes ready three two one go
we will now compare our art pieces because we have not seen each other's art yet. Although saying that these both are art pieces is a disgrace to Julie's picture because I have not seen yet, but I mean, let's see with mine and honestly it hasn't turned out that bad. Considering that I draw this with a trackpad, which was not the best way to play Mario Paint, and on an emulator, and also I suck at drawing, this looks pretty decent, so, yeah. Oh! <laughs> yes, uh, at least you choose a colored outline, yeah. yeah. If, if we can call it an outline, it's more of an out-dotted line. It... It's just the mouse that doesn't click into one straight line, just a little bit of dots. Now, mine looks very bad, so I'm very curious of yours. Ooh, this looks very good. Ah, that there's me. That looks very cute. That's that's very that's that's so cute, honestly. Uh, compared to mine, uh, I'd say yours is like slightly better, you know. It's a completely different story. <laughs> but I have to say, in the context of Mario Paint, your painting doesn't look that bad. I mean, you can do amazing stuff with Mario yes. Paint, but it fits. I love the game, I will say, at least. Like, for something very simple and almost childish, like, very easy to draw, even, it's, even, it, even if it has been really difficult, but... Yeah, it fits the style of the game, yes. Okay, so this was a very fun episode of The Savvy Show. It was a pleasure having you here, Joey. Thank you so much for coming in. And My pleasure! <laughs> Thanks. It was very nice uh, chatting with you. It was, very, it was a very fun afternoon. Very chill, very interesting. That the, was the original goal of this uh, show, so I'm very happy that people can have fun with this show and fun with everything that happens here. We had an amazing art challenge and we discovered the, the many beauties of Nintendo creations. It was, uh, again, a pleasure having you here. And um, as I said, go check Julie out with every single social media because He's a very nice person, and he deserves the world. And I have to get back to work now, and record more episodes of The Shabby Show. With that being said, you can just do your own outro if you want then, Joey. Bye bye! See you next!